Okay, so in number five, there's it's not necessarily just this, but uh, the the people who got some stuff wrong or didn't get it correct. Um, so one of the issues was let's close that. One of the issues was in two point eight. That was the uh, Van Hoff plot. And some of you tried some funny little two point slopes and you needed to really fit the data and show me fits. So that was a prism issue. Okay. Um, in 2.7, this is the number of super helical twists. And people got it wrong because they used 0.4 as a number. Kilojoules and the units are joules. So you have to use 400. You have to multiply by 1,000 to get it out to 400. And then you'll get the right answer. Okay. So uh, a couple of papers that are coming back or already came back to you had that correction. Um, 2.3a, <clears throat> that's the one that involved calculate. I think that question specifically was delta H minus delta E. And I think I already said somewhere that it was delta H, delta E. <clears throat> And maybe we went over that previously. I don't know. <clears throat> that ups ends up being equal to P delta V. Okay, P delta V, control V, there we go. But the, the conversion here, atmospheres times liters per mole has a liters atmospheres term per mole. And where some people have been making that mistake is that this is equal to so many joules. And so most of you who got it right use the 101.325 joules is equal to one liter atmosphere. And so if you use that as a correction factor, you end up with the right answer. And so some of you are coming up with a 1.6 answer, but the right answer is really something like 0.16. And it has to do with some, and it's joules, and it has to do with something, uh, it has to do with this correction factor. Okay, so that's the issue with that question. So that gets you there. The Clasius Clapeyron, it's asking, sorry, I think there's a column there. Yeah, it's asking for, it's asking for the, the change in, melting temperature under a certain pressure. And so you have to basically solve for the dependence of pressure on temperature. And the equation ends up being this equation. And so again, it, it ends up being a similar kind of unit issue, but that's, that's what you have to use. And this will answer the super helical twist. <clears throat> okay, and so I'm gonna save this. And you have this here, I can post this little thing out on canvas later. Okay. Um, so um, the last, I, yes, we went over parts of six. Jelena just emailed me to tell me that. And what we talked about was this stuff right here that I remember talking about. Uh, some of you were using four thirds pi r cubed to get B, which is the wrong units. I told you, you got to use four V bar M. <clears throat> so some of you are going to correct that. Uh, Lindsay took my suggestions and found that Bushy Sun virus is 14% RNA. So she then calculated a V bar based upon 14% RNA and 86% protein. So I came up with a number of 0.64, but she comes up with a slightly different number because it's mostly protein. So it's a different approximation, <clears throat> okay? And so that gets her a more correct answer. So I'm using 0.64 here, but her number is different. And so she gets the correct answer, quote unquote, 
uh, if you are aware of the fact that there's a different V-bar. So I don't remember what her number is, but I'm not going to tell you anyway. You're going to go do it. Okay. We talked about the table two. Um, we talked about the and and I said this is the table that gives you a hint as to how you solve this problem for fractional change uh, for these two conditions. <clears throat> Okay, one being a sphere and one being essentially a rod. And so the formula involves is L over D for one of them. This was a slope uh, extrapolation. And I think this, I haven't graded these papers yet because many of you have not turned in number six. So I'm sort of waiting for number six to come. But that's the only comment that I have about number six right now. It has to do with this change that Lindsay suggested. Okay. Uh, and everything else I think is correct. We went over it and uh, basically from what we went, if you went and looked at the video or what I just said, you'll get a hint as to what you need to know. Okay, let's bury that. Now in opening up this email, or in sending you a link, it's the same link we always use. I included a prelim question. <clears throat> um, and this is a prelim question I think I asked two years ago. Okay, and it's basically showing an example of a delta H delta S plot. <clears throat> um, which we haven't talked a lot about. We're going to talk a lot about it in the next couple of weeks because all of the papers that we're about to cover use this idea or it's a common idea that shows up, okay? And so the question is basically asking what's the relationship between delta H and delta S and why is this plot linear, okay? So that's the question. And, and those of you who are taking the prelims this year, you got a, some email from Miriam that has examples. And I think this was my 220 prelim question. But what I wanted to do, <clears throat> instead of answering that directly, are you gonna move? Thank you. Is what I said in my email right here. Um, define the hydrophobic effect, okay? What is the driving force and how are enthalpy and entropy impacted in the hydrophobic effect, <clears throat> okay? And so um, let's open up something that I'm pretty sure has this slide. I meant to have this open already and I didn't open it already for you. It'll be in med biochem. <clears throat> In biochemistry, it'll be this one, I think. I think it'll be um, thermodynamics. Ah, it's not in thermodynamics. Where is the hydrophobic effect? Amino acids and proteins, hemoglobin, enzymes. No. No, no. Okay, I'm going completely crazy here. Because there's a slide that I always present at the beginning. Was that not in thermodynamics? Maybe it was in thermodynamics. So,
I'm not remembering where it is, sorry. Let's do it in a different way. I, I know what the slide looks like. I'm, I'm, I'm irritated that I can't find the slide. Um, Dr. Correa, are you talking about the slide that shows the different non-covalent interactions? Yes, that's the slide. Where is I that? Think it's, I think it's in amino acids. Uh, I have slide 17. Okay, let's go there. Slide 17. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Douglas. All right, so this is a picture. <clears throat> this is the phenomena. Okay, and let me grab uh, my pen. So the idea in these non-covalent driving forces is um, that the hydrophobic effect is one of the driving forces for association. And if you bury hydrophobic surfaces that are complementary so that they can match up with one another, this in principle gains energy because of the van der Waals contact forces, which we generally don't add to the discussion, but they contribute to this, okay? Um, when you interact these surfaces, they get so close together that the water gets squeezed out, right? So the water getting squeezed out means that the water that is immobilized, the term clathrate comes up, is immobilized. Uh, it becomes freer in bulk solvent. So this is an increase in entropy. So this is a positive change in entropy. And that means for Delta G, a positive change in entropy is a negative contribution to the free energy because it's minus T Delta S. So this ends up being a negative contribution to the free energy. And that's a driving force, the release of water, all right? At the same time, the water that is involved in these buried or uh, unburied exposed hydrophobic surfaces, this water is hydrogen bonded to itself because it cannot hydrogen bond to the protein. The protein is hydrophobic. There are no polar groups <clears throat> or there's a small amount of polar groups. We will talk about this a little bit in terms of what we gain the term that we use is accessible surface area and a change in accessible surface area. <clears throat> and this gets reflected in both polar and nonpolar accessible surface area. Okay, and so we end up with terminology that talks about the polar and nonpolar surface and how each of these contributes something. All right. So this set of proteins that are interacting with hydrophobic surface is hydrogen bonded to one another, okay? So when it's released from the surface and goes out into the bulk, it's less hydrogen bonded, okay? So the enthalpy that's associated with this hydrogen bonding also becomes more positive because it loses the energy of the hydrogen bonding, okay? So the enthalpy also goes up, but the enthalpy going up actually lowers the free energy. It has the opposite effect on the free energy. So the entropy is a driving force and the enthalpy associated, this is the important part, associated with the release of water is positive, unfavorable. Okay, so if you just look at the water, the driving force here is the release of water, the increase in the, ent the entropy. The enthalpy due to the release of hydrogen bonding, the decrease in hydrogen bonding, okay, is also positive and therefore unfavorable. Okay, now I'm making the distinction, just the water, 
because we've now made bonds between the protein and the protein fit or interface. So maybe there's van der Waals context going on now. So we've gained something in the van der Waals context. Maybe there are in fact some polar groups in here. And so we're gaining something in terms of electrostatic bonding. Maybe there are some hydrogen bonding. So there are favorable interactions. It not, it's not just that we have these surfaces that match one another. <clears throat> they have to match one another and they have an attractive interaction. So that potentially also impacts this, <clears throat> all right? So the amount of entropy increase and the amount of enthalpy increase are coordinated or coupled to one another because we're talking about the water. But now the enthalpy that we're talking about, favorable interactions can also occur, all right? However, the favorable interactions between these two subunits, you can think of this as being immobilized. When two proteins come together, two monomers come together, they're both jiggling around. They have a certain amount of entropy. Now they bind. They're still jiggling around, but they can't jiggle around to the same extent because their dynamics, the diffusion properties, <clears throat> are reduced by some amount due to the immobilization. In other words, the entropy, the, the, the freedom of motion is reduced due to making a bond with another protein. <clears throat> so this other impact that the water gives you one thing, and that's what we talk about here in terms of the hydrophobic effect, but you're making bonds that could be favorable, van der Waals or electrostatic or hydrogen bonding. And then you have an entropy effect that is actually immobilizing the protein, okay, relative to one another. All right, we'll talk about this, as I say, in these papers that we talk in sort of succession <clears throat> where this contribution is there. Now, the immobilization usually has a name and we usually talk about how much change in the, enthalpy, in the entropy that we can assign to this task. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. Some of the papers made different assumptions than other papers. I won't get into that right now because you don't have a reference in your hand. I just put another um, um, folder or page, I guess it's a page out there in the module list that lists the three papers we're gonna be talking about, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Um, and they talk about a particular kind of assembly. And so we'll talk about how we deal with that in sedimentation data, but it also talks about the energetics of it. And we'll talk about the enthalpy and entropy from that perspective. And that's partially where this starts to come up. The immobilization contribution comes up, but I'm not done. <clears throat> what else happens? So these perfectly matched surfaces come together and you make favorable interactions. So there's an, a decrease in the enthalpy, there's an increase in the entropy because of this immobilization. But the third layer to the discussion, are there conformational changes? Are there rearrangements that occur because of this interaction? Dr. Correa. Yes. Did you say um, just now when those two surfaces come together, it was an increase in entropy or a decrease? It's immobilized. So they're becoming, uh, I might have said increased. They're immobilized, so they're becoming less dynamic. And so it's a decrease in the entropy. But the water molecules that are coming out has the increase in entropy, right? That's right. And they tend to be the bigger term, but not necessarily. It depends on what else is going on. How much immobilization is there? Okay. And then there may be conformational changes. So when we talk about oxygen binding to hemoglobin, there's some thermodynamics, some, some enthalpy entropy associated with oxygen binding. But then there are conformational changes that occur and the whole dimer eventually rotates. What does that do? 
what bonding does is made or broken. A hydrogen bond is broken in the Bohr proton, but what else might be going on at various interfaces that contribute? And so the story of the hydrophobic effect is simple. It's water, but it's not the truth because there are other things that are potentially going on that contribute and may be bigger than the water effect. Generally speaking, the systems that obey the hydrophobic effect that we talk about are things like membranes and assembly of membranes. Okay? And so they're mostly hydrophobic. They have very little electrostatic interactions. Okay? And so a lot of that is getting rid of water, hiding uh, nonpolar surface, et cetera. Okay? What interactions can occur, and there are electrostatic interactions on the surface of membranes, you've actually talked about with John in terms of how that electrostatic interaction might, might change and stabilize um, uh, the stability of a mice cell or something. Um, the question that I'm asking on this other page is asking about ligand binding. So let's stop this. We'll say keep that. Ligand binding. So this question is about ligand binding. And I'm showing you data. I actually stole this plot from something else. Um, it's a completely different data set than what I think it is. I think this is the paper that we're going to cover not in a, a week, but in two weeks. Um, so it's not what it says it is up here, but it gives you an ability to kind of talk about and think about the data. So this has to do with a drug, a small clinical compound. Uh, I use the term congeners. It just means that it's a, a related chemistry. It looks like the active components. And it mentions that the enthalpy and the entropy go up in unison. So now think about what I just said about the water. If the entropy is going up because the water is being freed, the enthalpy is going up because the bonding is being reduced, okay? But let's do this now in terms of ligands. When a ligand binds, okay, it becomes immobilized. So it loses mobility. I don't know if this pen is going to work on here. It, oh, here we go. Yeah, it moves, it loses mobility. So it goes in that direction. The entropy is reduced, but it's gaining favorable interactions. Okay. And so the enthalpy of binding is associated with the mobilization of the ligand. And consequently, these two terms are coupled to one another. Okay. And consequently, you tend to get a linear response when you plot the enthalpy and entropy for a family of drugs to an active site. <clears throat> that's the, uh, the idea and that's the logic. All right. You need to see this more in practice, and you're going to see it more in practice in the papers that we're going to cover. Um, or maybe the papers that I assigned to your presentation. I think that's actually where this is going to come up. Uh, this comes up in many different ways. I like to cover this in the context of drug discovery. <clears throat> I'm trying to make a better drug. What does that mean? Well, I would like it to bind with higher affinity. And so I'd like to have a more negative enthalpy change. But that necessarily means that if it binds with more enthalpy, I have immobilization of the ligand, which counters the free energy for that. Okay. And so there's a bunch of studies looking at the enthalpy entropy compensation. That's the term that we use for um, drug binding for ligand binding. And if I really want to improve the uh, overall free energy, 
So let's write it down here too. Okay, this is going to go down with an increase in, in binding because I'm making it a tighter binder. So the interactions are increased, but I'm immobilizing it. So the entropy is also being reduced, which makes this less favorable. And so they offset a little bit, okay? What can you do about that? So one of the things you can do about that, and this is another paper that we are not gonna have time to talk about, but imagine that I have A plus B binding to an enzyme, A plus B, sorry, binding to an enzyme, okay? And so what I get is an enzyme with A and B bound. A has to be immobilized, B has to be immobilized. There's enthalpy associated with the binding. What if I bind AB already covalently linked to one another? Now I have an enzyme with AB bound. The immobilization of A and the immobilization of B counter the overall free energy. Does that make sense? Over here, I've already immobilized A and B a little bit, not as much, but a little bit. So that when A binds, B has already been immobilized. And so it doesn't cost as much in tropic contribution. You see? So this transition, what if I had a ligand that had two parts and I tried to study them separately and together, I would find that there's this contribution that is interpretable in terms of um, an immobilization that already happened, okay? Uh, and I wanna come down here. What if I already have a ligand? What if I already have a ligand? Like this. But imagine what I have out here is some kind of a ring system. Okay. And this ring system is freely rotatable. So it's this example over here. What if I create a link to that chain that causes this to not be freely rotatable and then it binds? Well, in that circumstance, this guy has already lost its free rotation before it binds. And so when this guy binds, maybe this ring becomes immobilized on the surface of the enzyme. But this ligand is already immobilized in the right orientation. You could actually immobilize it in the wrong orientation and then it affects the binding affinity. That's actually part of this question up here. And so this ligand might bind better because it has the right attachments, the right enthalpy connections, and this immobilization cost is gone. It's not there, okay? And so you can man imagine making a whole series of structures that try to correct this sort of problem and that makes this bind a little tighter, okay? And so the idea is, is that you're not just improving the enthalpy, you're also trying to improve the entropy and this improves the entropy contribution because you don't lose this immobilization contribution. And so you're working on both an enthalpic and an entropic contribution. And that's what this question is sort of about. Now it's, I know when I asked this question years ago, this question from 220, 2020 is not when I first asked this. I must have asked this 20 years ago because I was covering papers that talked about this adaptive binding that I reference 
somewhere in here, okay? This is not just in the compound, this is also associated with conformational changes that might occur in the enzyme. So maybe different compounds induce or don't induce conformational changes. And some of those conformational changes might be favorable and some of those concentration conformational changes might be unfavorable. And that's the whole question, okay? That's the issue that you have to worry about. I think I shared a, uh, a review with you when we talked about hemoglobin in sickle cell. And I mentioned the fact that there were lots of mutations in hemoglobin that lead to increased oxygen binding and decreased oxygen binding. And so it's now coupling conformational stuff within the hemoglobin that normally are impacted by oxygen and either enhance or reverse that. It's the same idea. What is being what conformational changes occur upon oxygen binding, what mutations could make that better or worse. And therefore you could have mutations that create oxygen with higher affinity forms or lower affinity forms, which therefore then affects delivery and physiology, et cetera. It's the same conversation, except what I'm doing is I'm sort of now taking all of the thermodynamics that we covered, all of the annoying mathematics and thinking about, you know, all these entropic terms, first law, second law, et cetera, and applying it to biology and thinking about the application to biology. And that's what this question is. This question is sort of a summary of that. I think the best place where this is going to come up is in the, the papers we're going to talk about in the syllabus. We talk about some microtubule assembly papers. Uh, and one of my papers is there because it was a follow-up to a paper by Lee and Timoshev. And I reinvestigated the same ideas, except we looked at a bunch of ligands like um, GTP ligands that changed the numbers and then interpreted that data in exactly this way. And there's an entropic term and there's a loss of mobility term. All of that stuff is there in the interpretation of it. There's a conformational change term what conformational changes might be going on, et cetera. All of that is there in the data set and how you might discuss and use that in interpreting the overall data set. Okay, so I'll have a lot more to say about that when we get there. So for all of you, this is meant to be an integration, okay? It's meant to be an integration of what we've been talking about for three months. For those of you who are taking the prelim, this is meant to be a urgent integration. What might you say about a problem like this if I asked you this very problem? And I just gave you a simpler example, the hydrophobic effect. And I went through all of the related steps and now I'm doing it in the context of this question. All right, now the words and the equations have to do with these terms. It simply has to do with how do enthalpy and entropy affect one another? And you'll see something else that happens that I think you need to appreciate. If all of these guys are temperature dependent, and this is what's really gonna come up in some of the subsequent stuff we talk about. If all of these guys are temperature dependent, which they are, And that temperature dependence gets expressed as a heat capacity change, okay? A curvature in the data. That means that these connections are temperature dependent. And the enthalpy and the entropy are changing with temperature and the free energy is changing with temperature. But if the enthalpy change is offset by the entropy change, if it's compensated by the entropy change, the consequence of that is, is that the free energy doesn't change. It's almost flat. The enthalpy is changing, the entropy is changing, but they're changing in opposite directions in terms of favorability. And therefore the free energy is almost independent of temperature. It's less dependent on temperature than the enthalpy and the entropy. Okay, and that is usually shown in a figure that I'm not gonna reproduce right now because we're gonna get to it. 
but it basically is a flat delta G or more or less flat. It has some curvature, but a much more dramatic enthalpy and entropy change below it. Uh, and we'll see that in a lot of the papers that we talk about, as I say. Okay, and so... I don't know where I'm getting that from. I'm gonna put it here. And I'm gonna call this text because I wrote on it. There. And then I'm gonna close it. Okay. And so I'll do this again next week. I'll come up with some other questions. Um, we need to do the stuff that we're doing this Tuesday and next Tuesday for you to appreciate a lot of the other questions that I ask, because I ask a lot of questions that have to do with interpreting binding. So I like to ask questions. We went through, let me outline this in a general way. What is that? Oh, that's, that's a grant. These are grant things. Uh, let's do the sixth assignment and then let's open up a new. So, one of the questions that I'm not seeing in my looking, and I know this is a question that I've asked a lot. Subramanian, I think it's spelled that way. Remember the Ross and Subramanian? And it asked, questions about hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interactions, van der Waals contacts, hydrophobic effect, etc. And the question was, enthalpic or entropic? Okay. If you don't remember that, you should remember that. How do these various things contribute? Because that whole thing that I just went through, rearrangements and confirmation that may lead to increase or decrease, will increase or decrease in what? Hydrogen bonding, electrostatic interactions, van der Waals contacts. And how do they contribute to the enthalpy and the entropy? And so you remember in this paper, there was a table with Yes, enthalpic, yes, entropic, et cetera. And, so, and it was sort of, it was actually like this, I think. It was actually yes or no sort of thing. And, and each one of them had a contribution or not, all right? And so the hydrophobic effect, it's entropic, it's not enthalpic. And so this actually is going in the wrong direction or maybe the, I can't remember how the table was laid out, but it's like, it's not favorable. And so you needed to sort of know this to be able to understand what I just said. Is it an increase in varying of hydrophobic groups? Okay, that explains this part of it, but what about this part of it? Is it an anthropic effect or an entropic effect? And I'm not gonna answer those questions. I'm gonna warn you. So one year I asked the students to interpret Tell me what's in a Ross and Subramanian paper. What is a summary of that table, basically? Okay, that's potentially a question. And I think it allows you to even understand all of the things that I just said. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that. I have an idea in my head, but I won't go into it. I'll come back to it in the future. Presumably I'll remember. Uh, the other... type of question that shows up, and I, and I, I think it's in the, the set that you guys got in the, an email from Miriam, a certain data set, I define, I describe binding data in words. And then I say plot it. 
What are the ways of plotting these data to show me what the words mean? A good example of this might have something to do with a scattered plot where there's some change in the slope, which means there's some change in K and there's some change in the intercept. And you know that intercept because of the discussion in the question is two or four or six numbers of sites, or maybe it's high affinity, low affinity, and you have to take into account both classes of sites, et cetera. So scattered plot potentially would be one of the answers. What are the axes? What are you learning from it? What's the satur saturation plot look like? Am I asking you for a hyperbolic curve? Am I asking you for a, a sigmoidal curve? What does the data look like? There's also a description of a, a double reciprocal plot, et cetera, et cetera. So I've asked in the past questions that ask you to remember, given this information, explain this in graphical terms and explain it in multiple ways, not just one way, what the data would look like when you plot it. I'm giving you the interpretation in the question, what's the data look like? Okay. One of the things that we'll, we'll, we talked about a little bit, I don't always completely get into it, is this is what the data looks like for oxygen binding, percent saturation, okay, on a scale like this. But if you plot this on a log scale, okay, this curve suddenly becomes also sigmoidal because that's sort of what the curves look like but imagine that these had the same midpoint okay they don't have the same midpoint because myoglobin and hemoglobin don't look the same but if they had the same midpoint we would have a sigmoidal curve that might look like this but then we would have another sigmoidal curve that might look like that and the point that I'm trying to make is, is that it's a broader curve. It's a broader curve because the middle one is cooperative and the other one is non-cooperative. And the cooperativity makes this a sharper transition, whereas the lack of cooperativity makes it a shallow transition. And so remember, there was this R factor in the discussion in the course in medical biochemistry where Generally speaking, a non-cooperative binder, you need an 81-fold change in concentration to go from 10% to 90%. With hemoglobin, you need a two to three-fold, two-point-something fold to go from 10% to 90% because it's so sharp. And so now here's 10% and here's 90%. And this change in concentration therefore is dramatically reduced because of the allosterism. And so plotting this on a log scale gives you a different picture. And I'm pretty sure I said, because I always usually say when I was showing these data that the width of this transition tells you something about cooperativity. Is it cooperative? Yes or no? This is no, this is yes. And you can see it by looking at the axis down below and how big, how big the transition is. Is it this broad, 81 fold? Is it this broad, two, three, four fold? Okay. And so being able to plot stuff in different axes and knowing what a scattered plot is or knowing what a direct plot is or knowing what a, um, and then the other one that we always do is the hill plot, okay? So remember, it, it's something that has two parallel lines and a transition between them, okay? Where that gives you the hill coefficient and that's a slope of one and a slope of one, et cetera. That's the affinity of the high affinity form. That's the affinity of the low affinity form. And this is something like, um, theta over one minus theta, something like that on this log of, and this is concentration. Okay, so knowing what a hill plot looks like, okay? 
Uh, you had to do all of that when I went through weeks and weeks of binding and answering questions. What if I asked that on a prelim question? Do you remember that? It's unfair in some ways, I'll say it this way. It's unfair in some ways. Uh, I'm gonna save this to prelim and I'm gonna call it, um, examples. Uh, because I look at binding data all the time. I read papers all the time. I hear seminars for people show binding data all the time. I mean, I've been doing this for 50 years. That's not a joke. Okay. And so uh, I immediately do everything I just said. I look at the axes. I look at the transitions. I look at how much data is actually in the in the in the plot and know that there's not enough data there to interpret the data that kind of thing you know you guys live in a world where people in the rest of the people in this department don't do that they don't look at binding data right the whole purpose of this course is to make you think about binding energetics thermodynamics favorable unfavorable in a quantitative and in a qualitative way all right. And most of my colleagues here, your mentors, your other teachers, don't think this way. John and I are the only two people in this department who think this way every day. Okay, And so that's what I'm instilling in you. How quickly will you lose that? And will you be able to recover it when you need to for a prelim and for the rest of your career? Okay. So <clears throat> I've managed to talk for almost 50 minutes. Is there something else that you want to talk about right now? Or do we want to just wait now until Tuesday? Uh, I want to ask you about the presentation that we have to do at the end of this semester. Um, yeah, so what happens is I have a series of papers. So let me show you an example, okay? Because I'm still thinking about it. I usually make up my mind eventually. <laughs> but I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. And a lot of the papers are in this folder. Is that where it is? Yeah, so I'm going to give you a paper. And each one of you are going to get a paper. I yep. may let you choose, but the choosing is just basically, you know, I may just give it to you. This is a paper by a guy by the name of John Ladbury. The thermodynamics of protein ligand interactions in salvation insight from ligand design. So John used to be um, in London. And I think this paper was when John was still at the um, University College London. Uh, he's moved since then to Texas, he's at Southwest, I think. And this paper is about how do you select drugs and how do you use thermodynamics to help you select drugs? And this is the point of that. And let me blow this up. This figure shows a summary of enthalpy entropy data in some database that is linked to, um, a, is a list of drugs that are in clinical development. Some of them are biological, so they're used in biology experiments. Some are actually in the clinics. Some of them are just numbers that were reported and they have no relevance to biology or medicine. And so it's basically an enthalpy entropy plot, although they've changed the axis to be minus T delta S. And what it's showing you is on average, every one of these compounds obeys the enthalpy entropy phenomena. The entropy and the enthalpy are correlated. They fall on a straight line. There's no connection between these drugs and one another, between the enzymes and the medicine. They just all follow a rule with some uncertainty. So there's a width to this curve. 
And then the question is, are these drugs enthalpically or entropically driven or both? And what can you conclude about that? And the axis is done in a way so that you can see where the free energy is. And therefore there's a magnitude of Delta G, all right? And so discussing this paper is a way of summarizing all of this. Now this paper in some ways is maybe better presented as a paper in a topic. Because I often, in this particular case, these papers have to do with thermodynamic drug binding lecture. And so a lot of these papers are related to this and they bring up other kinds of concepts. The one I mentioned to you about varying the enthalpy and the entropy at the same time, that's something that's discussed in a lot of these papers by Ernesto Freyer because he worked on an HIV, a family, he's working on a family of HIV drugs that where they've adjusted the enthalpy entropy in concert to try to maximize the overall affinity. And it's the same idea, okay? So this is in best done in sometimes as a, um, as a, a lecture where you read the papers and we discuss them. And that's when I really try to force you to discuss. There are some other papers that I'm thinking about presenting using. There are some papers that have to do with binding. So I, I no, that's not the paper. That's not it. Huh. Well, I'm gonna to have to look for it because I thought it was there. So how much time is uh, allocated for individual to present? Um... 30, min 30 minutes is the goal. Okay. So and you want us to make PowerPoint presentation? Yes, that's really what you are asking me. I, I've drifted off into something else, but yes. Okay, okay. This is the, I think this is the one. This is a method developed by Jeanette Carey 30 something years ago. It's a, it's a method for um, measuring binding. It's a very simple quote unquote method. I think this will be one of the papers that somebody gets to present. It's called mobility shift. In the paper here, she calls it gel retardation, but it, was a, it, it has become known as mobility shift. That may be an example where I assign that paper to somebody and you present the paper, okay? Um, in principle, we do this, uh, it'll take us three and a half, four hours. So we'll have to do it over a couple of days. And do we create a different slot, time slot? Do I try to do it over two weeks? So the class ends the last week of May. And so conceivably, this will happen between the, 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 the end of May, the last two weeks. Uh, I think class ends on the 24th. It's the 29th is where, cl <clears throat> where class, I think, ends. Uh, John is going on the 26th. So we might be doing it on May 24th and May 17th. And those may be the time slots that we do for three and four presentations. So that's how it's going to happen. And, and I'll get those to you um, in the next week or two. Okay, I'll make them available in some way. Okay, I just have to come up with seven of them. And I recycle a lot of these papers, but I'm trying to actually come up with some new ones this year. That general mobility shift paper is a new one. Uh, I've never asked the students to present that or read that paper. There's a much better paper about it, but it's way, way, way more complicated. And so I may not choose that one. <clears throat> Anything else right now? No, thank you, Dr. Puglia. Okay. So I'll see you Tuesday. Yeah, have a good weekend. Thanks, Dr. Korea. Okay. And...